Control of the air is one of the most important principles in modern warfare. Air superiority means better intelligence gathering, logistics, coordination, and of course, access to direct aerial support for the rest of the military. Air superiority can be challenging, risky, or flat-out impossible for some militaries to achieve. In cases where it is not an attainable goal, the principle of aerial denial is often employed. Aerial denial focuses on preventing the use of the airspace by the enemy, typically by employing ground-based air defenses. One type of weapon has become crucial for aerial denial and anti-aircraft warfare in general, man pads. Man portable air defense systems, or man pads, are small, usually shoulder-fired missiles, mainly for use against low-flying aircraft and helicopters. These are versatile weapons that can be used from almost anywhere by almost anyone. Development of man pads began after World War II, when it became apparent that new anti-air weapons would be needed for dealing with faster planes, especially jets. The World War II strategy of strapping together as many machine guns and cannons as possible wasn't going to work in the jet age. Okay, it could, but try carrying one of those things. Early man pads, and most in service today, began as offshoots of existing air-to-air -air missiles. The first to enter development were the American Red Eye and the Soviet Strela, or Grail. These used lead sulfide detectors for missile guidance, which were simple and cheap, but had a few major drawbacks. First, they could only detect the hottest part of an aircraft, so only the direct exhaust. This meant that in most cases, they could only be fired after an aircraft had already passed and was flying away from the launcher. Second, they could easily be confused or interfered with by anything more radiant than an engine. These detectors simply guide towards whatever the hottest thing they see is, such as the sun, sunlight reflecting on clouds, or flares. This made many early man pads completely useless in many conditions. Still, these early models were widely produced and were somewhat effective. Sure, the chances of them actually hitting an aircraft were low, about 20% at most, but they could stop a plane from achieving whatever objective it had. Yeah, that's a low chance for a hit, but no pilot wants to stick around to find out if that number is true. Scaring a plane off from its bombing run is just as effective as downing it. They were a lot quicker to set up and fire than the alternatives, like a heavy machine gun or anti-air artillery. Plus, they worked really well for helicopters. Slow, low-flying targets were perfect for these fairly simple manpads. Their first major use in combat was during the War of Attrition between Israel and Egypt from 1967 to 1970. Egypt was given Strela IIs by the Soviet Union, and these saw mixed results. Reports about how many kills these systems achieved is hard to be certain about, since the Strela II, like many man pads, has a self-destruct feature for the missile. To prevent the missile from hitting an unintended target on the ground, the missile will blow up if it fails to hit the aircraft. Inexperienced soldiers would see the explosion vaguely near the plane they were targeting and assume they shot down the plane. Even in cases where the missile did hit, it wasn't always a kill, as planes can often limp back to base after a man pads hit. There's even a case of an Israeli plane that was hit, but the missile failed to detonate and got lodged in the plane's tailpipe. Sources vary on the number of Israeli aircraft downed by Strelas in the war, but the number is somewhere from 15 to 40. While they did have their niches, early models with uncooled lead sulfide detectors weren't good enough to justify the production and training costs in the long term. Both the United States and USSR would upgrade their designs to use thermoelectrically cooled detectors instead. This made the missiles more likely to pick up a target, but limited them to a narrow range of the infrared color band. Generally, this was a good thing, since it wouldn't go veering off into the sun as much. This development most notably created the Strela 2M, the most widely produced man pads of all time, at around 500,000 missiles. This model first saw significant use in 1972 in Vietnam, in service with the People's Army of Vietnam. North Vietnamese forces had been using RPG rockets for a few years prior, shooting down American Huey helicopters and slow-moving planes. American crews had quickly learned how to dodge these, but they were caught off guard by being actively chased by these new missiles. New tactics were quickly invented. The most common was for planes to bank as hard as possible into the missile. Since this Strela variant could only detect the exhaust of an aircraft, it would lose tracking and miss the plane. Flare guns were given to helicopter crews, which were surprisingly effective at losing missiles when combined with sharp maneuvers. Again, manpads kill numbers are really unreliable, but aircraft losses to Strelas in Vietnam is probably somewhere in the low hundreds. Thermoelectric cooling was an improvement, but still wasn't quite enough. Manpads had now seen some combat use, and their shortcomings were becoming more apparent. It was during and after Vietnam that more advanced countermeasures began to be devised. Helicopter exhaust diffusers were a troublesome but clever invention. They would redirect the exhaust into the helicopter rotors, depriving the seeker of a solid target to lock onto. Modulated infrared countermeasures, commonly known as hot bricks, were also introduced. 
These would generate pulses of infrared light, confusing the seeker and causing it to lose the intended target, like jamming but for heat seekers. And of course, flares became common, big bunches of magnesium designed to burn brighter than any engine that can be thrown far from the aircraft. Man pads had to become even cooler to keep up. Cryogenic coolers for the detectors were deployed by both the USA and USSR for their next generation of man pads. This worked by adding battery cooler units, or BCUs, to the launchers. These would be activated just before launch, the battery would power the whole seeker section of the missile, and the nitrogen would cool the detector. This did put the person manning the launcher on a timer, however. The nitrogen would only last about 30 seconds, and needed to be launched within that time. The new variants also moved away from lead sulfide detectors to indium antimonide-based ones. These new detectors could track more useful ranges of infrared, and combined with innovations in microprocessors, were able to target aircraft much more intelligently. All of this innovation resulted in the creation of the American Stinger missile and the Soviet Igla missile. This generation of man pads moved towards modularity, allowing for easier upgrades and lower manufacturing costs. Most were no longer one big fused-together launcher. The grip stock, where the expensive components are, was no longer stuck with the launch tube, which wears out after a few uses. This is why you might see grip stocks, launchers, and missiles counted separately in data about man pads. Those new microprocessors made the new systems easier to update, and new targeting data could be added with a simple software update, rather than needing whole new hardware. The new detectors could now pick up ultraviolet light as well as infrared. This made them much less vulnerable to infrared countermeasures. Flares and the old-style hot bricks couldn't fool these, though more modern hot bricks could. IFFs, or Identification Friend or Foe systems, were also introduced at this point. Combat experience with the earlier models, particularly in Egypt, showed it was very difficult to identify if a target was hostile or friendly from a few miles away. IFFs can pick up a particular radio signal from nearby air targets and discern if it is, as the name suggests, a friend or foe. If the aircraft was friendly, the operator would be informed, usually by a particular tone or beep from the launcher. Some models would even prevent the launch of a missile completely if it detected a friendly aircraft. The previous models, Strela and Red Eye, had found many export customers around the world. With this new tech, however, the Soviet Union and the United States were less willing to sell. This was a benefit for the Soviet Union, which was mired in a war in Afghanistan. Afghanistan's difficult terrain made the Soviet army dependent on lots of air support, particularly helicopters. The United States, of course, wished to help the anti-Soviet guerrillas, but there were concerns about exporting the new Stinger to them. The U.S. Army was concerned that they would fall into the hands of the Soviet Union and China, aiding their own manpads development. These fears were made irrelevant when it was discovered in 1985 that a company licensed to produce stingers in Greece had been selling stinger parts to the GRU, the Soviet Military Intelligence Department. Stingers flooded into Afghanistan in 1986 and quickly began racking up kills. With help from the Pakistani Intelligence Service, the ISI, Afghan rebels were taught how to use the new weapon. Soviet Mi-24 Hind helicopters, previously impervious to the rebels' weapons, were extremely vulnerable to the new Stinger missiles. Soviet helicopter and plane losses tripled with the introduction of the Stinger. Soviet helicopter pilots had to fly excessively close to the ground to avoid Stingers, and Soviet planes had to fly higher than usual to stay out of the Stinger's range. Soviet helicopters eventually weren't even allowed to get close to the front lines, and had to stay back using only their long-range missiles. Soviet cargo planes landing and taking off were also vulnerable to stingers. The Soviet Union took similar measures to the US and Vietnam, making sure planes had flares and putting exhaust diffusers on helicopters. Really similar story to Vietnam, where the man-pad problem was overcome mainly by crews learning to avoid and dodge them. Soviet air losses stayed fairly high after 1986, but they never returned to the disastrous levels of that year. Man-pad kill numbers are, as always, unreliable, but estimates are around 300 helicopters and 100 planes lost to man-pads. Those battery cooler units certainly helped, but they weren't without their disadvantages. In the 1991 Gulf War, Iraqi forces had the semi-new Igla missile. Iglas shot down 13 coalition aircraft, the best performance of all Iraqi anti-air systems. Not a great number, but it was a threat the coalition hadn't anticipated and proved somewhat potent. In the 2003 Iraq War, however, the Iraqis didn't have this advantage. Iraq had bought most of their Iglas in a 1983 deal with the Soviet Union. The BCUs only keep the nitrogen in for about 10 years. There were already a few minor malfunctions in the Gulf War, but nothing compared to the catastrophe in 2003. Almost all Iraqi Iglas failed to fire. One officer recalled trying to fire over a dozen Iglas at American aircraft, with none of them launching. 
No American planes were shot down by manpads in the initial invasion, though some helicopters were during the insurgency phase of the war. Manpads have seen significant use in all the major conflicts of the 90s and 2000s, but perhaps the one that had the most direct effect on their development was the 2008 Russo-Georgian War. Russia heavily relied on close air support in the brief war, mainly the Su-25 plane. Pro-Russia South Ossetian militias had igloos in their stock and were overzealous in their use. Despite having IFFs on the launchers, Ossetian militias shot down two friendly Russian Sukhois. Russia hasn't released any more information about how this happened, but theoretically the IFF should have prevented this. This probably influenced Russia's next manpad, the Verba. Sometimes lumped into the Igla family, this is the newest major manpads platform. The Verba epitomizes the trend of manpads development in the last few decades, greater integration with the rest of the army, and more computers. The Verba has an integrated display that shows nearby air traffic, friend and foe, and a queuing aid that alerts the gunner to approaching targets. The Verba is the new guy, but it's worth looking at some other manpads developments that happened through the years in other places. Remember how the Americans and Soviets didn't want to sell the Stinger and Igla? Many countries, particularly in Western Europe, began their own domestic manpads programs as a result. One of the most infamous was the British blowpipe system. This used human guidance, where the operator had to manually aim at the target the entire time, while separately guiding the missile using a small joystick. Theoretically, this meant almost any type of target could be engaged in any condition, but in practice it was nearly impossible to use. One British officer who used it during the Falklands War described it as trying to shoot pheasants with a drain pipe. Argentina and Britain both used the blowpipe during the war, downing one plane each with it. Roughly half of the missiles experienced technical problems shortly after launch. Britain would use this experience to create much improved systems later, including the venerable Starstreak missile, though I would say it really stretches the definition of man-portable. A lot of the alternatives to American and Soviet man-pads are pretty bulky, like the French Mistral. The Mistral can't be fired from the shoulder at all, it has to be fired from whatever this is. The idea is that it doesn't matter you have to be strapped into this office chair from hell, because man-pads teams are going to be moving with a vehicle anyways, carrying extra missiles and spare parts. You do get a way more powerful missile, though. Still, can't exactly be doing hit and runs with this thing. Same sort of deal with the Swedish RBS-70. This one can be thought of as an improved blowpipe, using lasers and advanced computers to guide the missile rather than infrared. All this makes it pretty heavy, needing three people to move, though the missile isn't all that powerful. Laser guidance alone wasn't very effective, so a new variant was made that added thermal imaging to assist the operator. Kinda defeats the whole point, huh? Nonetheless, from the little combat it has seen, the RBS-70 is fairly effective. More traditional manpads have been developed over in Asia, mainly by China and Japan. China got their start making unlicensed copies of the Soviet Strela-2, known as the HN-5 family. These are basically identical to the Strela-2, and they've made their way into the hands of China's usual export partners. The next major iteration of Chinese manpads, the QW series, was also a copy of the Soviet's homework, the IGLA this time. At least, at first glance, China did some really interesting upgrades and modifications to it. The QW-3 uses semi-active radar-based homing for guidance. There's not much more detail about how that exactly works. I'd imagine it has to be for after the missile is launched. I doubt you could have ground-based radar that small that can actually do anything. But, I don't know, and the Rand Corporation paper about it doesn't know either. The latest variant, QW-19, interestingly has a mode for manual guidance if the operator chooses. China has one more manpad family, the FN series. Not much is known about this one, but it's believed to be mainly for export. It's made its way around the world into the stocks of plenty of rebel groups, downed a few helicopters in Iraq and a MiG-21 in Syria. A Chinese-made jet was even shot down by a rebel group in Myanmar using one. Some real war profiteering. Japan's got a mysterious one too, the Type 91 missile, also known as the Keiko and Hand Arrow. Developed by Toshiba, of all people, it was meant to be an upgrade from Japan's imported stingers. It is one of the only manpads to use visible light as a primary targeting medium. Some can use visible light, but the Type 91 is dependent on it, as well as infrared. It has a unique feature where it takes a picture of the tracked target upon launch and simply pursues that image. This defeats many simple anti-manpads measures like flares, with the downside of reduced accuracy at night. Due to Japan's restrictions on exporting military equipment, they are the only ones who use it. This is part of the reason so little is known about it. Half the information online comes from a GeoCities site. Even in Japan, it doesn't see a whole lot of use. It's only used with one unit as a manpad, as far as I can tell. Its main use is in helicopters and mounted on vehicles. This is the fate of many manpads. They aren't really infantry weapons anymore. Most armies want them integrated into a vehicle nowadays. 
I'm a little sad about that, because I think the idea of one guy being able to take down the biggest death machines humanity has ever built is really cool, but that isn't how it worked out. This does somewhat solve an issue associated with man-pads, that being their relatively unfettered proliferation around the world. Man-pads aren't hard to transport, and they aren't hard to use. This makes a lot of governments very uneasy about the amount out in circulation. The main concern is that they could be used to target civilian airliners, and there have been a few cases of this happening in the past. Generally, though, it isn't a concern now. Civilian planes fly too high for most man-pads, and can only be targeted on landing and takeoff. There aren't too many places in the world where a group willing to attack civilian planes has access to working man-pads, and can get close enough to an airport to use them. Man-pads have been one of the most revolutionary pieces of military technology in the post-World War II era. The democratization of air defense has changed how wars are fought, forcing militaries to adapt their strategies and technologies continuously. What began as simple, heat-seeking missiles with rudimentary targeting has evolved into highly advanced systems integrated with broader military networks. Man-pads have proven their effectiveness not just in conventional conflicts, but also in asymmetric warfare, where smaller forces can challenge the dominance of technologically superior opponents. However, their proliferation poses a significant security risk, especially in the hands of non-state actors. As a result, global efforts to regulate their trade and usage have become essential. While the future of man-pads may lean towards vehicle-mounted systems and advanced countermeasures, their impact on modern warfare remains undeniable. 您好,